very happy to be here. And Pico, it's such a delight to see you, and especially to talk about this wonderful new book, The Half Known Life. Um, it, I just read it immediately and then read it again. Yeah. Um, the writing is wonderful, and I'm so happy we can talk about it. Uh, I wanted to start by, because there's so much in this book about uniting different cultures and, you know, um, really about opposites and how they are all part of the same reality. And I thought about your name, and I thought <laughs> your parents, both of them professors, your father of philosophy at Oxford and your mother a professor of religion, gave you this name Siddhartha Pico, from Pico de Mirandola, which is an extraordinary um, gift. <laughs> and how do you, I mean, deal with the name of the Buddha and the name of the extraordinary philosopher who tried to unify Judaism and Christianity and all religions? And I see you doing that. I mean, I just wondered if this name plays into that in some way for you. Um, thank you. In fact, I remember once we were talking and you said, gosh, your name really charts your destiny, your identity, <laughs> yes. which I'd never thought of before, but you're absolutely right. My parents were really clairvoyant in a way because, as you say, they were so steeped in every religious tradition. They were theosophists, so by temperament they knew about most of the great religious traditions and also because they were philosophers and, and teachers of religion. Uh, and so, of course, it's one of those things when you're growing up, you're immune to or unaware, oblivious to the many blessings around you and inside you. So it took me a long time to realize that they had equipped me perfectly for the global world and the global life that I would lead. As you say, my first name uh, is that of the Buddha, but they knew if I was called Siddhartha in England, I'd become Sid or something worse. <laughs> Um, Pico de la Mirandola, you are the rare person who identifies. That's the source of my second name. And of course, as you know better than anyone, he was a Catholic heretic, heretic who pledged himself to bringing religions together, who yes. some say was the founder of Christian Kabbalah, who wrote a version of Plato's Symposium. His famous book was On the Dignity of Man, and who in some ways alienated the orthodoxy by being such an, an inquirer of, of thought and imagination. And maybe unbeknownst to you, my third name is Raghavan, my father's name, so there's a theosophical presence. And my fourth name, Ayo, is a very classic South Indian Hindu name, belonging often to priests. It's like the, the Kohen in the Jewish tradition. So willy-nilly, I did get um, four whole religious traditions to carry with me with my every breath. And, um, and because I was growing up to Hindu parents in an Anglican society on my way to deeply Buddhist Shinto Japan, uh, I probably in some ways lived the life that my parents might have hoped for me. And just before we go any further, I really want to thank the Asia Society, as you heard. It's been my home for 31 years. I think I also spoke about its Islamic mysticism here. But most of all, you're so generous to give up time in your very busy life to endure this book twice. And you know, I feel a little abashed because you've devoted your life to rigorous scholarship of all these religions, and I'm just a bewildered tourist in them. So I'm very grateful that you would come and share your expertise with us. Thank Sometimes you. Sometimes you speak of being a tourist or an outsider, and mm. I, I wonder what that means to you, because yes. when I look at the work and when I know you, I see your immersion in these traditions. Traditions. I like that plural because I suppose what it means to me and why I cling to that status is I don't want to be fixed in any assumption yes. or sense of knowledge of the world. Yes. Um, and I want to try to be open, especially as a traveler, to uh, wisdom from whichever direction it comes and almost regardless of the orientation or lack of orientation of the person I meet. I was just talking to somebody this afternoon and I was saying, if I go to the doctor, I don't know and I don't care whether she's a Christian or a Jewish or nothing at all. I need the medicine she's going to give to assuage certain pain. And that's how I feel, you know, as you know, I spend a lot of time with monks and you spend a lot of time with monks. And yeah. the reason we do so um, is because they have learned how to love, how to live, and how to die. And that's not something most of us have the chance to attend to very much. So I go to them as to an emergency room uh, for their counsel. Yes, I noticed that medical image in, yes. in your book. Yes. And you spoke about um, these traditions teach how to relieve pain. Yes. And, and that's a very 
important and significant thing. I mean, certainly Buddhism places that almost front and center, but certainly Christianity and other traditions do as well. Yes, and you, you read the book so closely. Thank you, yes. I always think of, of the Buddha as a doctor of the mind, essentially, which means he can never keep us living forever. He's fallible. He doesn't have the answer, and he has only one method, and there are always many other methods. And as you know, he likens different religions to medical traditions, and some people respond better to Ayurveda, some to Chinese yes. medicine, some to Western medicine. Uh, but just as you say, it's interesting, when I talk to His Holiness, and I've been talking to him for almost 50 years now, he often says, in his opinion, the, Western, uh, the Eastern traditions, especially Buddhism, because of its isolation from the world in Tibet, really had a chance to deepen its sense of the inner landscape and, and cultivate very refined and complex forms of meditation. But he says the Christian traditions um, are so good at, at, at tending to the suffering and dealing with pain wherever they see it. And he says he often urges his Tibetan monks to turn to their Christian brothers when it comes to... Um, doing what Mother Teresa did, or going out into the streets and really offering help where it's most needed. And he's, So he's speaking exactly to what you were saying, that, um, that in Buddhism a teacher is almost by definition a physician, but I think often um, in Christianity their nurses and, and I think Pope Francis said that he wants his religion to be like a field, field hospital in the middle of war. So exactly as you say, they're both assuaging pain in different ways. Yes, well, it's, it's what makes your books very unique is, is the way you uh, have it embrace a kind of cosmopolitan perspective. And I also thought about your, early, your discussion in this book about coming from one world, a, a, the Western world <laughs> where you grew up in, mm -hmm. in London and uh, at, at Eton, which you said, uh, at Eton, this was less than paradise. Almost every tree was forbidden, and not a single even sight. <laughs> um, and you, you would go from there to yes. Santa Barbara, yes. and there you said it was fresh liberations and wide blue horizons, the summer of love, the Grateful Dead, Hunter Thompson, Rolling Stone, anything was possible. And so you're going between these two extremes. Yes. I'm just wondering how that struck you at the time. And, Yes, and, and how it strikes me now, yes. too. Interesting. And of course, well, you were going. you were still making those movements. Yes, and you were, it's, I almost bumped into you because you were going in the opposite direction, having grown up in, in Palo Alto and then <laughs> studying in Oxford. Um, so you know exactly both, both poles. And you're right, from the age of nine, I was going alone over the North Pole every three months back and forth. And in England, we were reading Paradise Lost, from which you quoted. And in California, the idea of paradise is alive and urgent and round the next corner. And so in some ways, I think of it as a commute between skepticism and faith. And I think in England, I got a very rigorous classical education and then a training in questioning everything. And at three, at 11 hours later, when I got off the plane in Los Angeles, I was embracing everything, and everything was possible, and it was a, a really a dialogue between the past and the present, because my school was from yes. the 15th century, and California is yes. the home of the octative tense, it's the home of uh, the future, the spiritual home of, of possibility, even, even now, whether it's Silicon Valley or Hollywood or its many manifestations. You probably remember in the second chapter of this book, I cite uh, Seamus Heaney, the great uh, Irish Nobel Prize winning poet who when he saw Nelson Mandela released from prison after 27 years, while writing a play about the Trojan War, dared to commit now famous lines, once in a lifetime, hope and history rhyme. Yes. And, yes. and that resonates throughout this entire book, but as I think about your question, I was really commuting between hope and history. And England was steeping myself in a sense of everything that had been done, and by implication everything that couldn't be done or needn't be done. And yes. California is the cathedral of hope in some ways. Uh, and so I'm, I'm grateful that I wasn't, again, fixed in either one of them, but I could play them off against one another and try to, to bring them together so that each would give strength and durability to the other. Because I think most of my books at some level are about trying to marry hope and realism. And that's why I find His Holiness the Dalai Lama so inspiring because he's a master of realism. Nobody yes. is more grounded in, in the pragmatic and he's been leader of his people for 83 years. So we can't deal in wishy-washy notions or romances of the future and yet he never gives up on hope. So how do we bring those two together, see the world as it is and yet 
have confidence in its future because I think you can only love something once you really see it in all, with all its manifest and manifold shadows and complications and imperfections, actually. Well, one of the things I love is because Western religion is usually exclusive if you're speaking mm. about Judaism, mm. Christianity, and Islam. And, and, and yet your perspective embraces far more. Mm. And as you said, the Dalai Lama sees the value in very different approaches. Uh, I, I find myself very much a disciple of William James who talks about uh, the varieties of religious experience and that certain kinds of engagement with traditions involve certain people and their needs and somebody else that may have a very different, um, a very different way of, yes. of approaching worship or approaching the divine or whatever we call it. The divine. Yes, and actually just as I was driving here an hour or so ago, I saw a big advertisement for Costa Rica and it said it should be experienced, not explained. And so I love that religious experience <laughs> because he's not talking about religious theory or religious belief systems yes. or religious canons. It's the experience which is actually open to people who have no formal religion, who maybe don't care about religion, as well as to religious people. And as you know, I quote him in this book saying that we're similar to dogs inside a library. So we're surrounded by deep wisdom of every kind, but we're not sophisticated enough to be able to, to read it. And yes, I think one reason the Dalai Lama is at the center of this book, just as you say, yeah. is he's so grounded in his own tradition, he's open to every other. And I love the fact that he will give long lectures on the Gospels to groups of Christians in England, and tears will come to his eyes when he's describing the parable of the mustard seed. He knows that Jesus is a Buddhist teacher or Buddha is a Christian teacher in certain respects. Yes. Um, he's called himself a defender of Islam. He turns to rabbis for guidance about how to sustain uh, a culture outside its own homeland. And of course he stresses most of all uh, science, which is something universal and human. And it's interesting how the Dalai Lama, such a revered religious figure, published a book 12 years ago called Beyond Religion because he's seen how religious doctrine, or shall we say dogma, divides yes. us even as the spirit of religion is about bringing us together. Uh, and so he doesn't want to cut out everything that's so moving about all the great traditions, yes. but nor does he want ever to say his is the best way. And I remember he once again, he very touchingly told me that because he grew up in isolated Lhasa, until he met Thomas Merton in 1968, or until he came out into India, he said he really thought Buddhism was the best religion, because it was the only religion he knew. Yes. And as soon as he was surrounded by Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims, and then encountered this very serious, committed, intense Christian monk, he thought every one of these has at least as much to offer as my tradition. And one reason that Thomas Merton, of course, is um, at the center of this book too, is I sense the same spirit in him, and you probably know more about him than I do, but I'm so touched that Thomas Merton, after 27 years, in his Cistercian monastery in Kentucky, finally made it to Asia. Yes. And then after three excited conversations with the Dalai Lama about monastic tips, you know, can you watch movies, should you be vegetarian, <laughs> <laughs> should you have an Eve in sight or not, um, went to Sri Lanka and found, as he thought it, his realization looking at two Buddhas and then died four days later. Yes. But as far as he was concerned, these Buddhas opened up a window to him that nothing in his own tradition had. Uh, so just at a time, you know, I think everyone here senses how the world is more connected than ever before, but it's also more divided. And here are people yes. daring to look out over the wall and across the street and, and realizing yes. they don't have all the answers. Yes, I mean, I, I liked, I was, you were, tr I liked one thing you said, you said he, the Dalai Lama never suggested that one belief system is truer than any other, and that's where you talk, he talks about a medical metaphor. Yes. But, but I, I think when we talk about religious traditions as belief systems, I think the paradigm is often taken from Christianity, mm -hmm. which defined itself as in terms of a creed in the mm -hmm. 4th century, mm -hmm. which I think is unfortunate in some ways, um, because it's as though it's an ideology. Mm -hmm. And the more I study it, or this or any other tradition, seems to me they are not about what you believe or what you think, what your mental constructs are, but how you practice, yes. what you do, yes. what kind of meditation or prayer or whatever. 
Yes, and actually, uh, am I right in thinking, I feel that your work with the Gnostic Gospels is in some ways about opening the doors between the Christian tradition okay. and all these others. And I suspect if a Sufi or a Zen teacher were to read the Gnostic Gospels, they say, that's just what we teach, that's what we share. Um, and certainly, as you say, it's a practice that um, everybody can partake of. I, as you were speaking about belief systems being less important than meditation or, or just life in the world, I was remembering that moment, if I may, in your last book, Why Religion, when you just suffered two catastrophic losses. And as I recall, on the eve of a memorial service, is that right, that yes. was going to be very difficult, um, wonderful Father Thomas Keating came. And as I recall, he didn't offer you theology or text oh, or no. theory. He never did. He, is that right? He invited you into meditation, and that was the medicine you needed. Yes. I mean, that was a, that was a big surprise. I, you know, had a Protestant background myself and really no affiliation with, with particular churches or religious groups at that time. And I met some Cistercian monks mm. in Colorado mm. uh, through a friend who's a musician, and that was Robert Mann, brilliant violinist who founded the Juilliard Quartet. He and his son had gone to the monastery and said they were invited to become the first Jewish monks. Um, <laughs> and, and he was very much interested in the monks. Mm. And they loved him. And he invited them to his concerts, and they never came. And he complained to them that they never arrived to the concerts. They said, well, we can't leave the monastery. So he brought music up to the monastery. Oh. He brought a wonderful quartet up, and he invited a few friends, and I was one of the people lucky enough to, to go with him. So I met these, these um, very deeply cloistered Cistercian Trappist Roman Catholic priests and monks. It was a tradition quite unknown to me. But if you walk into that monastery on 5,000 acres of land in the Colorado mountains, it's like a deep well of silence. Mm. And you didn't need to know anything except just what it was like to be there. And Thomas, whom I got to know quite well, um, had a quality about him that was indescribable, mm. but powerful. Mm. So he came, yes, he came to New York a night before a memorial service for my late husband, and I was terrified to go to Rockefeller University because my husband wouldn't be there. And I didn't want to go there and find that he wasn't there. Um, and Thomas called me up and said, may I come visit you? And I said, of course. So he came and we meditated. And then I had an experience that energy was coming toward me from many places, and I had no idea what what that was. Mm. And I finally spoke to Thomas after about an hour, and he said, oh yes, that happens. <laughs> he, he had a very deep sense yeah. of internal reality yeah. and of the value of silence yeah. and the healing power of, of that kind of tradition. In fact, I think he said beautifully, silence is God's language and everything else is a poor translation. Uh, and you won't be surprised to hear that in my little apartment in suburban nowhere Japan, uh, I spend my evenings watching Father Thomas Keating on YouTube because he just radiates such delight and joy. You feel here's somebody inhabiting the divine. He's not talking about it or <laughs> speculating about it. It's inside him and he's inside it. And it's, it's just a rare privilege to witness something like well, that. Well, as I mentioned um, to you before, he, he grew up here on Park Avenue. Yeah. Uh, at, with a great deal of beauty and privilege and yeah. went to Yale and deeply disappointed his father by not going into finance and business. Yeah. Uh, that was very hard for him. But yeah. to go to a remote monastery where people didn't speak, the, the yeah. discipline was silence. Yeah. And Thomas became the founder of the contemplative prayer movement. But he didn't care that I was a heretic and a Protestant, yeah. you know? Yeah. We, we were just welcomed. Yes. I'm, I'm so thrilled to hear you say that because, as you say, I don't have a religious tradition, but I often think silence has been my great teacher. And as you know, in fact, but, well, you may not know this part, I'm, right, I'm just completing a companion book to this book about my 31 years with a yes. group of Benedictine monks in Big Sur, California. And again, just as with Father Thomas Keating, uh, they opened their doors to everybody. I'd say the majority of people staying there are women, and I think mostly maybe Buddhist people visiting or Sufis or nobody at all. 
but they know that in silence each person will find what she most needs and it doesn't and they don't need to put a name on it or to foist their doctrine on anybody so exactly the same thing uh, you know and silence is non-denominational and and silence you know speaks to everybody and i think until until i went to convents and monasteries I thought silence was just the absence of noise. I didn't realize it was a positive presence that is constructed the way you might construct glass walls um, through devotion or prayer or meditation. But it's an almost tangible presence. As, as you know, you go to Snow Mass, I think, in Colorado, and I go to New Camaldoli in, in California. But it's, it's something that you can feel. It's not the same silence when you, I get out at home of my car. Uh, and, and by clearing away my thoughts, it seems to tell me what's true. That monastery is a very unusual group yes. of monks, yes. I gather. Yes. I mean, yes. you say Benedictine, yes. but it's a per particular sect of Benedictines of some kind. Yes, again, you are the rare person who would know that. Yes, it's um, the Camaldolese order, which are the most contempl contemplative order within the Catholic Church, who in fact, I think, was specially given permission by the Vatican to interact with uh, other religions, so they're very close to the Zen monks in Tassajara, 14 miles away, and, and actually go back and forth with the Esalen Institute nearby. So you're right, they're, they're committed to uh, an inner landscape that, that's so deep that every division and wall and barrier uh, falls away. And in fact, most famously, some people will know of Bede Griffiths, who yes. uh, became part of the Camaldolese order too, and who wore a dhoti and ate with his hands and slept on the floor in southern India and created uh, a Hindu ashram, and it was, um, or a Catholic ashram really, it, it was based in Catholicism, but it was understanding that India has a lot to offer. And I think there's always a danger in this, I think Houston Smith, great explorer of religions, talked about salad bar <laughs> spirituality, you know, take a little bit of Christianity and drop some Sufism in there, and, mix oh. it. and that I, I think only, the, the more widely you spread yourself, the less deep you are probably. So that's a danger that in an age when we're all exposed to so many traditions. Uh, but it's interesting that the people who really know what they believe are the ones who are most ready to learn from everybody else, and actually not to talk about what they think is true, but to find out what others believe is right. Yes, I mean, that monastery is quite remarkable. I mean, I, I was also reading in your book about um, intentional communities where, as you say, all the rage when you were yes. um, first in California, and that it's very hard to have a group, a focus group like that, without having, as you say, a circle seems to need a center, and the center yes. usually becomes either a leader or a doctrine. Yes. And so it becomes, well, it doesn't have to become ossified, that's what I was going to say, but it often does. Yes. And we've seen that happen a lot. We, yes, we do, because utopia is usually based on a collective vision, and almost everybody in this room has her own notion of what par paradise is. So it's very difficult. And you know, I go to places like North Korea to remind myself how dangerous it can be if one person says, this is the vision that everybody has to share. So I can imagine a group of people sitting in a circle in silence, and I think there that group would, would gain from one another's presence. But if they're sitting around a circle, and as you said, there's one person in the middle who is a mortal and who is a human being, then inherently it's, it's going to be based on quicksand, probably. Um, so I, I do make a strong distinction, I suppose, between utopia and, and paradise, feeling that paradise has to be open to everyone. Um, and utopia usually isn't, because it's, it's, it's built a separation between its vision and the world's vision, maybe. Well, you write about many places in the book. Yes. And what, what, is, what do you gain from the travel? I mean, you talk about Jerusalem mm. and, and mm. India and Japan and Santa Barbara and just <laughs> a range of, of different, and, and uh, Sri Lanka, yes. and many places that people think of as the most beautiful places in the world and sort of perhaps looking for a kind of ideal, perfect place. And then you, you uh, beautifully articulate the complexity of the world and the reality of that place, part of which is beautiful and part of which isn't. But beauty has a shadow, and we're not ideal perfect people, so we can never find an ideal perfect location or, or life, I think. But I'm so glad you mentioned that, because I was just thinking of Jerusalem, because it speaks, I think, very directly to what we're talking about, in the sense that I'm not a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew, but I get moved almost to tears when I'm in Jerusalem. And sometimes I'll be walking down the street in Japan, and I'll feel myself pulled magnetically because places have charisma as much as people do. 
towards Jerusalem. Uh, and when I'm there, even though it's a place of such intense conflict yes. within the traditions and between them, every morning in the pre-dawn dark, I go down those narrow, barely paved lanes to a little side chapel in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And I sit there in this rocky little cavern with an uncertain ledge and a flickering candle. And I feel something is very powerful there. I know that place. Do you know that? Oh, it's, yes. It's not the side where I, everybody else no, goes. No. It's not where everyone lines up to, no, to kiss yeah, the stones yeah, where Jesus yeah, was yeah. supposedly laid. I mean, that, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre itself is a, is a, a display of division. Uh, it's a civil in war. In so many yes, ways. Yes, yes, civil yes. war, yes. yes. It's, a, it's a place for war between Christians. Yes. Could, could you yes. elaborate for people who haven't been there? Well, six Christian orders sleeping under the same roof, and if the Franciscan steps a centimeter over the Greek Orthodox line, they start hitting each other with brooms, and it's sometimes come to <laughs> outright warfare uh, between the Ethiopians and the Copts on the roof. So, and, and it's two Muslim families, I think, who for centuries have, ha have held the keys and lock these six feuding factions under uh, the door every time when it, and, you know, under the roof when it gets dark every night. And yet, there's something in the, that's built up over 1,700 years of prayer and devotion and chant that grabs you, and it's undeniable. And I think, I think of Varanasi as its Asian counterpart, and oh. here we are in the Asia Society. Uh, and one of the beautiful truths that Varanasi teaches me is that the holy doesn't have to be pure. The holy can be based in the filthiest river on earth. Uh, the, the Holy River Ganges was decreed by the World Health Organization, as you read, to be 3,000 times beyond the maximal level of fecal coliform bacteria safe for consumption. And, and the pilgrims wonderfully, delightedly, and gratefully are drinking from that water because for them it is the holy place. So it explodes all notions of sacred and profane. And I sometimes think yes. that the really holy person is one who doesn't think about sacred or profane. I mean, you can find holiness in everything. Um, those are sort of the people that we're looking towards in many cases. Um, and the other beautiful thing about Varanasi is that, have you been there? I haven't. Uh -huh. um, well, so as you're walking along the holy river Ganges, to the north and to the south there are flames burning yes. through the day and the night, uh, dissolving dead bodies into ash. Yes. And as you're walking through the narrow lanes, people are constantly running, carrying stretchers to commit corpses to the flames and to the water. And um, there were these na naked ascetics walking around, smeared in ash, um, who were literally living in graveyards, drinking from skulls to show their indifference to conventional notions of right and wrong. And in the middle of this mayhem, the city of death is a city of joy. In other words, the people who are, who are surrounded by dead bodies and carrying the dead bodies are doing so in a spirit of thanksgiving and praise. And so it's a very good overturning of our simple assumptions, our black and white assumptions, that you know, life is a wonderful thing, death is a terrible thing. Not at all. There, death is a doorway to liberation. Of course, not everybody feels that. I'm of Hindu origin, but I'm not a practicing Hindu, and yet uh, it packs a punch. <laughs> and it, it shakes you up out of your easy notions. And these places are, are power points, because you know, it's only six miles away from Varanasi, that the Buddha delivered his first discourse in the deer park at Sarnath. So yes. it's, it's like, well, Big So, or there are many places across the globe that draw a certain kind of person and energy. And then interesting things come out of it, flying off in different directions. Um, and I remember I, I was writing about this recently, I was standing in front of this, this scene of intense confusion along the Ganges. And suddenly I heard somebody call my name. And it was uh, two Tibetan Buddhist monks from New York City, actually. One, <laughs> where else? Um, one, an elderly <laughs> Tibetan, very well known to Buddhist practitioners in the city. But the other, um, a younger American man, whom I'd last seen on Fifth Avenue, <laughs> uh, who was the first Westerner ever to be deputed by the Dalai Lama to be the abbot of a Tibetan Buddhist monastery in southern India. Uh -huh. And so my American friend, Nikki, surveyed the scene. Isn't this glorious? This is reality. This is birth and death and everything in between. This is what we have to embrace. In other words, as the Dalai Lama, I think, would say, or most people from other tr religious traditions, don't yeah. sit there dreaming of the never, never after or paradise being in the yeah. past. It has to be right here. In fact, when I, I live near Kyoto, as you know, and when I step into a temple in Kyoto, 
inscribed at the entrance on the ground in Japanese is written, look beneath your feet. Don't look out there. <laughs> Don't look to you know, the year 2050. This is the only paradise you're going to find. Oh. And, and I was thinking a lot about that, and maybe that's the reason I wrote this book during the pandemic, because everyone, all of us, were living in a state of such uncertainty, yes. maybe anxiety. And the question I think many of us were posing was, how can we find such calm and contentment we need in a world that's always going to be difficult and yes. full of conflict? Uh, we can't wish conflict out of the world. That's the first noble truth of the Buddha. We have to find our paradise within the context of challenge. And uh, yes, and, Conflict and, the, and illness and death. And illness and death and forest fires and viruses and hurricanes and everything else that puts us in place and reminds us we're not in the driver's seat. For anyone who reads this book, in almost every chapter I'm always in the passenger seat being driven around by a local. Yes. And it's literally true, but it's mostly a metaphorical truth because I remember when I was young, I thought, I'm in the driver's seat of my life. I'm in control, I know it all, I'm on top of everything. I can plan out my life very well, as most of us think in our 20s. And the beauty of getting older is you see you're entirely in the passenger seat at the mercy of all these much larger half-known forces that determine our lives. And really, the challenge of life is what you do with everything you can't understand. And when you write the title, The Half-Known yes, Life, yes. you're talking about what we don't understand. Exa just the things we, we, I was describing, falling in love, suddenly a virus shuts down the world, suddenly forest fires appear, this happened to me in my house and wipe out my house and every yes. last thing I own, I suddenly a car is driving in the wrong direction or a doctor comes into your room wearing a dark expression, all of us go through that a lot and I think those are the, the, the big moments of our life, sometimes beautiful as when suddenly we're transported to the Patala Palace in Tibet we're taken out of ourselves by the wonder and beauty and intensity yeah. of that place or when we fall in love and sometimes very difficult as with, as with the virus. Yes. But I think that of the things that we know as being this little tent up in the Himalayas late at night and so we may have lanterns and we probably have a flash, flashlight but it's still this tiny piece of light surrounded by this vast darkness pinpricked with stars and the sort of silver majesty of the outline of the mountains. But what we know is so tiny. Well, that's what William James was saying when he was saying we're dogs in a library. <laughs> There's no shortage of wisdom in the world, but we, we don't have access to it. So we have to, I think, surrender, at the very least, understand how little we know and how little we can manipulate or anticipate. Well, much of the time you speak about um, romance with the divine, and I, you spoke of Rumi that way. The line was, these mystical verses traffic in language of the everyday, and I thought that's, traffic is obviously <laughs> the language of the everyday, to evoke a far deeper romance with the divine. And obviously you share that romance. And, and yet, as you say, the monastery that you love in Big Sur and many others, like Thomas Keating's monastery, now that he died a couple of years ago, and the abbot also died. Uh, there is another abbot, but it's, you know th those monasteries, both of them, yes. the one you love and the one I've loved, are full of old men, and there aren't a lot of young postulants, yes. right? Yes. So what happens with that? I mean, mm. I, I guess the question I wanted to ask you is, you, you love the monastic life, mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah. and you're not going to be a monk. Right. There's a great deal of sensuous love of the world in your book, mm. and of science and reality and conversations with all kinds of people. So is there a way that those traditions can speak to many people here, probably among us now, but all over the place, who really have a sort of longing for some, some sense of the divine, but who aren't going to become monastics, they aren't going to you know, follow those kind of traditional paths. Partly as one of the monks said to me at, at St. Benedict's in Snowmass, because we have much longer lifetimes. But is there a way to adapt those traditions so that we can uh, engage them? I mean, you engage them sporadically and yeah, quite, as you choose, quite, going in and out. Quite. And that seems to me a way, possibly, or what about the Zen Center in Tarahasa, for example? Well, you, as ever, you put your finger on it, and I'm a prime offender. You're exactly right. You're not because, an offender. I mean, well, you're I maybe feel a I, pilgrim or maybe an innovator. <laughs> but no, but I feel like 
am a bit of an offender because you're exactly right. So in the time I've been in this monastery, so 31 years now, the number of monks has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. Yeah. And the number of oblates, which are lay people in the world who try to be true to the principles of that monastery, has gone up from seven to 800. So everyone wants to partake of that. And in right. fact, as you say, everyone can partake of that the way you and I have done by going and hanging out with the monks. But nobody wants to make a lifelong commitment anymore. Uh, in the land, in a time of short attention spans and a time of access to everywhere, it's harder and harder for yeah. us, whether it's marriage or monasticism, to take that leap. And now, as you say, because those monasteries are full largely of old men, there are many young men who come starry-eyed with the possibility of giving themselves to that life, but they don't want to hang out with people who are in their 80s or 83 or infirm or whatever. And so it's a self-perpetuating problem. And that's a big problem because I think monks are nuns too, and they're going through the same problem, are doing invaluable work. They're making this yes. silence open to us. Um, and they're like the people stoking the boiler room that keeps this beautiful ship sailing that you and I can step in and out of as if it were a cruise ship. But if they're not there, there's no ship. And so I'm not sure that the beauty that you and I enjoy could exist without those monks. And the only answer is um, people not doing what I do, but actually being brave enough to take, to take the plunge. Um, I remember when Thomas Merton wrote The Seven Story Mountain, as you recall, there was a big flood of people going to the monasteries. Not all of them survived. Many of them had to work through their illusions and quickly left. But nonetheless, there was a big boost. Uh, I hope it's a cyclical thing. When I was at this hermitage in the 1990s, they had so many young men coming who wanted to be a part of their community that they had an overflow. They didn't know how they would sustain the new monks financially. They were actually opening new houses elsewhere to <laughs> ship these guys out. Um, now suddenly, the the world is moving in a very opposite direction, and I, I, I really worry about that. Um, is, it, is it the case that in Buddhist monasteries you can be part of the monastery for a, for a certain committed t period of time? I mean, I, I was thinking of the abbot at St. Joseph's Monastery, Joseph, who said part of it is that we live so much longer, and if you could you know, be part of the monastic community for five years or take a vow for that, or two years or one. People go there after they're widowed or after some situation they have to deal with um, and stay and then it relieves the pain and they leave. I mean, doesn't that make sense? My sense is that's wonderful for the individual and not good for the monastery. Because it becomes a sort of glorified spiritual hotel or you know, well, guest Well, is, is that maybe. a bad thing? Again, not for you and me, but <laughs> for, the long, for, for it to uh -huh. survive. How are they going yeah. to get lifelong people to feed us and take care of the finances and, and make sure that the, the guest house, so to speak, is in good repair? I mean, I don't know that much about Buddhism. I think in, in Thailand, many young men, I don't know about women, but young men join a monastery for a year. And of course, in, traditionally in classical Tibet, a huge percentage of the population were monks. But that was partly because families had lots of children and they didn't know how to feed them and support them and they would send the little boys to there for education and, and to be taken care of. Um, and of course when monks were exposed to the outside world, uh, even with Thomas Merton, do you remember he went, he fell ill and oh, he yes. went into a hospital and he instantly fell in love with his 20 year old nurse and yes. plotted an escape <laughs> from, from the monastery. So yes. Uh, yes. monks need to be protected from us in some ways. Uh, <laughs> Because then they're, they're not immune to temptation. Uh, but it's, it's interesting, uh, one of my, my friends in the Catholic monastery said to me, well, at least in Tibet, the monks are supported by the community. Because it's true, in my experience, Tibet is a very, very faithful Buddhist community. Monks are held in high regard, and people do everything possible to try to keep the monasteries going, including sending their sons there. And now, thanks to the Dalai Lama's uh, efforts, their daughters can all go to, to nunneries in, in India. But he said, here in the United States, yeah, nobody needs to be reminded of the scandals in the Catholic Church and people not going to church as much as they used to. Um, and he said, we're, we're the opposite of being supported by the community. We're really countercultural. We're like a little oasis of something um, that's swimming against the tide in every way. Um, and so, we're, as you say, we're all so grateful for what they bring to us. But I often ask myself, what am I bringing to them? 
you know, I can I can help them financially and I can write about them and in just the spirit you're saying and say, please everybody, if you spend three days in silence, you'll be more restored and renewed than you could imagine. But that's not going to keep the monastery going, I don't think. One interesting thing, and I won't go on endlessly about the monastery because it's not even contained in the book we're meant to be talking about. <laughs> but uh, right now, as every winter, they're cut off from the world uh, for weeks or months on end by winter storms. And they're always about, they're living on a fault line and they're always about to slip into the sea. And I'm really moved, the more difficult things become, and His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the same, the more confident they are. They, they never, at least publicly, waver in their faith. So that's very stirring for all of the rest of us who go through our problems to see people who, who, one way or another, realize the problem can only make them stronger. Um, but it's another example of my gaining from them, but not necessarily they from me. I see what you mean. Yes. Um, but it's, it's, it's inspiring to see that. And on some level, it's what we all need to see. You know, how, how can you continue to love in a world of loss, where we're all going to love, lose our loved ones or lose ourselves before our loved ones? Um, and, uh, I guess, you know, I, I tend to the heretical, as you know, mm. and, and I, you know, people talk about church attendance is down in the United mm. States and all that stuff. Uh, people don't engage in these traditions the way they did. Uh, often, that's for very good reasons. You know people and I know people. I, I think that's to be applauded in many ways mm. because there's some aspects of these traditions that are very negative. Um, and every tradition, yes, absolutely. I mean, humans can never live up to the visions that they're giving voice to. Um, and probably, you know, obviously, quality is more important than quantity. If there are five people in a church and they're selfless people, that's much better than 500 who go to church on Sunday mornings and then return to <laughs> whatever the excitements are in the world. Um, so, yes, I mean, as you know, in the book, Emily Dickinson is a, is a central presence, because she, yes. for me, is a perfect example uh, of somebody who clearly the, wasn't part of any religious community in the sense that she didn't leave her room for 26 years. But by living that deeply interior life, into her room came death and eternity and light and everything powerful and, uh, and intimate. Uh, and I think she's one of the great religious presences of all time, uh, even though she was always slipping out of any definition you might impose on her. And I took the title of the book from Melville, because he's the great haunted quixotic seeker. He was always trying to find God and find the relation to Satan and uncover the meaning of life, which meant he literally lost his mind. Uh, I read his book, Pierre, which came soon after Moby Dick, and my edition was prefaced by a 48-page essay by a psychiatrist saying this is a record of a person losing his sanity. And for decades he would just walk sleepless through the night the streets of Manhattan, unable to settle, forgotten by the world, and having asked questions he could never begin to answer. Whereas Emily Dickinson seemed to have the wisdom to sit with every possible possibility, maybe because she was a kind of meditator inherently. So I don't think she was looking for answers, but she was just catching glints of light, which are changing yes. perpetually. Uh, and, and then happily sharing them. I know. like that. She wasn't looking for answers, but catching glimpses of light. I mean, that, that's, that's quite a different kind of exploration. I, I mean, when you started this book, at least I'm, I'm asking, because it seems to me when, when I start a book, I don't know where it's going. Right. And I don't know what will happen. Yes. And that's part of the creative adventure of the whole thing. Um, do you have a sense of where this book took you um, in some... Hmm, thank you. Well, I was very excited when uh, Rachel mentioned the underworld. Because as you know, I, I affect a catabasis. You know, in Dante, yes. in Homer, in Gal Gilgamesh, I think, you, you have to travel through death to come out at the other side. You have to go down into the underworld uh, to arrive at some vision that can outlast death and suffering and challenge and everything else that can take them all in. Uh, so Comparative Hell is coming here on, on February 7th and this is Just a book what about... what we need. <laughs> yes. Well, this is a book about Comparative Heaven. I, I, yes. I don't yes. think I knew exactly where I was going and I, I didn't want to know in some ways. And I, initially, my first sentence for the book will be, Light, life doesn't permit of an answer. In other words, I'm not trying to find an answer, only yes. to pose a question. Yes. Um, and the solution to anything 
doesn't come in, in finding a rational answer. Right. Um, I heard, you may know more about this than I do, I heard that Pope Francis, when he prays, isn't praying for an answer to his problems. He's praying for the courage and strength to live with answerlessness, to live with the fact that he'll never be able to get the better of them, but he can address them with clarity uh, if, if he's so blessed. Well, I'm very glad to hear that, because that idea that, that religions are about some kind of answer to, to people's questions seems to me really mistaken. Yes, or maybe, as we were saying before, it's like a doctor's answers. You know, that, yes. that one goes there with a, with a pain, and they have certain expertise, and they'll make a diagnosis and offer a prescription. A prescription, yes. something to do. I was recently reading mm -hmm. the book by Tanya Lerman at, at Stanford mm -hmm. called How God Becomes Real. Mm -hmm. and, and she says, it, it's not about belief systems, it, that various traditions create attunement to meaning, attunement to one's life. Um, by practices of prayer and meditation and, uh, and devotion and often compassion and so forth. So she's saying it's, it's this experiential aspect. I guess that's, yes. as you said, that's why yes. I love these secret gospels yes. because they're all about that. They're not about doctrine yes. at all. Yes, um, yes. Attunement is a beautiful word. That's the book that's on my desk. That's the next book I'm going to read, Tanya Lemons, for precisely that reason. It's an excellent um, book. Yeah, well, you're the one who recommended it to oh. me. <laughs> so, oh, well. <laughs> but, yes, I'd heard wonderful things about it previously, but how God may, becomes real, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so the reality is a, is a beautiful word in that sense. She's, this, the subtitle is about kindling the presence of invisible spirits. Yeah. And she talks about attunement and thinks that it has a lot to do with one's capacity for imagination and sensitivity to certain kinds of um, perception mm. that are not ordinary perception mm. and that we have to deal with. And as Tanya knows, she also writes about visions and voices yes. and realizes that religious experience is on a is on a continuum with insanity, in yes, some ways, as yes, you spoke about yes, yes. Uh, about Melville, Melville yeah. and and others. Yes, that that it's it's slippery. It's almost dangerous in some ways, and yet there are ways to find a lot of deep grounding. Yeah, because it's about surrender and yielding to something far beyond the rational or the conscious mind, as passionate love is, because it's a variation on that. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I've forgotten what I was going to say, luckily for us all, but it may come back uh, in a minute, because what we're saying was... Um, yes, well, let's, let's continue, and yes. I hope it comes back, because um, what, yeah, what you were saying is um, yeah, so true to, I think, what all of us know, and, and I think everybody is aware of how much, as you said, division religion has wrought in the world, and how fallible individual priests and monks are in every single tradition, Tibetan and Zen as much as Catholic, and yet we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. In other words, the fact that religion is so compromised and qualified and imperfect doesn't mean that there isn't something inexplicable and mysterious that moves us and stirs us. Um, you know, I, I go and sit under a James Turrell sky space. I feel transported. It doesn't matter really whether it's religious or not. He did grow up in a Quaker tradition, and the cha chapel, the chairs are lined up like pews, and he knows that the light is very important. Uh, and maybe you know, light is another way of putting it. Um, I listen to Van Morrison's songs, and I'm, I'm carried away to a very different state of consciousness. I think that's an advantage music has over words, because it bypasses the rational word and goes straight to the part of us that is most responsive to that, which is why so much music is inherently spiritual, whereas writers working with their analytical temperament are often chafing against that, um, except the rare writer. Annie Dillard is one who can just give herself up to something stronger than, than, than she is. Um, and yeah, I think Tanya Lerman is writing a lot about those, those states of abandon. Um, yes, she is. So I wrote a book called Abandon, which I, which I presented here, which is about Sufi mysticism, oh. um, and about that longing to, to let go give up control, and the illusion of control, and the illusion of knowledge, which is, you know, that's why we want that's to fall in love. That's a lot to give up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we're so happy when we do, I think. Isn't that what happens when we fall in love? 
it, suddenly the world makes sense and there's no accidents and it's all this, we're walking through this golden singing network of meanings um, precisely because we're, we've taken leave of our senses. And of course, that doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't last very long and the, the critical question is what you do after the honeymoon. But still, it's an intimation of something. Yes. It's, it's a glimpse of the person we could be in other states and I'm sure, you know, when I see Thomas Keating speaking in his 80s online, I think there's somebody in love, big time, lifelong, and he's not going to be disappointed. Yes. Mm. Well, thank you. Well, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps we can open up a yeah. discussion. Thank you. I'm so touched and excited to see all those questions. I mean, you've spent so much time thinking about this book. It's the greatest compliment and present a writer could ever have, so thank you. Well, it has so much depth and play. Sometimes it's very funny and, and <laughs> playful and curious and you know and and then it the writing is clear in a way that that's rare i think you have to i don't know if you have to work for that clarity i know i do if i try to be clear and and, and very direct thank you very very hard work um i think yes. my model is Leonard cohen and i think one reason people respond to him so much is he writes so lucidly about mystery Everything he's writing about you can't grasp and is beyond our comprehension. But the l words themselves are crystal clear. And yes. If you listen to his beautiful song, If It Be Your Will, almost every word is just a monosyllable. If it be your will, I shall sing no more, etc. Um, they couldn't be less complicated words, but they're opening up to something vast and uncontainable. Maybe, maybe Rachel is going to... So we'd like now. to open it up. Yeah, uh, thank you. You Wonderful. Raise thank you. your hands. I'll run over and give you a mic. Uh, because we're recording, um, it'd be great to wait for the mic. But um, OK, here's your chance. Everyone's practicing silence, just as we oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> advised. Um, this isn't a question so much as just an appreciation of um, the tremendous joy and humor that um, that you emanate, as well as the um, the deep, deep erudition, you know, from your background. So I just wanted to say it's very inspiring because um, usually the monastic life, the religious scholarship life. The academic life always seems so um, lugubrious, you know, so gloomy, <laughs> and so, and you're the opposite of that. So you sort of embody. Um, I'm just very inspired by your joy and your sense of humor, as well as the erudition. So, thank you for that. Thank you so much. I, I was I was telling Elaine um, earlier tonight that when I first met her, which is not very long ago. I couldn't believe she was a professor. <laughs> I thought she was a writer or an artist or a dancer or many things. And then she, you told me that, in fact, those are the people you hang out with. And you write in your book, Why Religion, that you're drawn to artists. And oh, yes. Yeah. Well, yes, I mean, scholarship is, is a very different matter. And, <laughs> and, you know, I thought that that sense of joy is something I particularly love about the Buddhist tradition, too. Mm. Because the Buddhist monks laugh a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian monks are pretty serious much of the time. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I always wanted to see them laugh more. <laughs> yes, actually the last time I was on the stage, I was talking about Japan, and I was referring to that phrase I've heard in relation to Japanese life, which is joyful participation in a world of sorrows. So precisely that, from the Buddhist point of view, every life is going to have suffering and difficulty, but that doesn't preclude joy. And it's just like what I was describing in Varanasi. The fact that, that life is n never going to go the way we planned doesn't mean we have to despair of it. Yes. Pico, I, I love all your writing. I just have a question about Kyoto. Why Kyoto? Do you plan to die in Kyoto? Is it, what's so special about Kyoto? <laughs> uh, sorry, I couldn't hear the third question after, are you, am what's I going so to die in Kyoto? What's so special about Kyoto? Well, I live now in Nara, um, 20 miles away from Kyoto. It's easy to answer the first question. Uh, the first time I set foot in Japan, I was living um, here on Park Avenue and 20th Street, and I was making a business trip to Hong Kong. And I just had a 20-hour layover uh, at Narita Airport outside Tokyo, which many of you will know. And I woke up, and my plane was at 1 in the afternoon. I had some time to kill. And so uh, I just got in a shuttle bus and took a free trip around the town of Narita. 
and it was a late, aut late October day, which means in Japan blazing blue skies, but the first turning of the leaves, a symphony of red and gold and yellow in the parks. And something in that so pierced me that on the basis of walking around the airport town of Narita, I decided to move to Japan. And I gave up my wonderful job here in Midtown, and I've moved there, and as you say, I've been there 35 years. So I could give you lots of explanations, and I could tell you it's an exotic version of the England I grew up in, but I think really it's inexplicable, the way you will meet a stranger and you feel you've known her forever, and you know her better than your friends and family. So that's why I live in Japan, and if you live in Japan, of course, Kyoto, especially if you're an unemployed person like myself, is the perfect place to be because 1,600 Buddhist temples, 17 World Heritage Sites. It's, it's the center of classical aesthetic um, Japan. Whether I will die there, if I had, if in an ideal world, I would spend every day of my life there, for sure. But now as I think about insurance and other practicalities, I'm not sure whether I would have to come back into the arms of Medicare instead of the <laughs> Japanese health system. But spiritually, I would, I would want only to live and, and die there. Um, and was the third question, why Japan? Why so special? I think you answered it. I think I did, yeah. Thank you for the question. Thank you both so much. Um, I wonder if you'd indulge me a little uh, forecasting. Uh, you mentioned the rapidly changing uh, statistics around religious affiliation, monasteries, uh, not recruiting so many young people, uh, and the kind of syncretism of your own yes. spiritual life, if I, may, yes. if I may use that language, which perhaps is why Japan is also so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If you both look ahead and think about how religion itself will change, do you imagine new religious movements or a kind of synchronism movement or do you imagine religious traditions continuing as they are but just in smaller numbers? It's such a good question. I would like to turn to the scholar of religions because I'd, I'd love to know what you think. Well, you know, I do history and not prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think those are the best guesses that I would have but I don't know. I, I, think, I think many people, as I say, are leaving traditional institutions for a lot of good reasons. And I do think they should transform, or they would need to transform. I'm thinking of Christian churches. I participate in an Episcopal church in Princeton because it has a wonderful priest, and the best services of all <laughs> is when they do the monastic service called Compline, in which you walk into this beautiful church, um, dark, with candles all over the floor by the altar, and the choir walks in silently. And they begin to sing evening prayer in Latin and in Thomas Tallis and Palestrina and mm. Mozart. And just they sing for 25 minutes and they walk out. And it's perfect. Mm. So I don't know. Um, I guess I. But the other side of it is that as. William James points out, and I think Tanya Lerman very much agrees. I see her book as a kind of continuation of James's tradition, which I love. People are very different, so what they need is very different. Some people, like you know, St. Mary the Virgin in, uh, in New York City, which is very high Anglican. Some people are Quakers, Unitarian Universalists, Muslims, Sikhs. So many different traditions appeal to different people in very different ways. So mm -hmm. I think we need all of them. Mm. And I think it's always, every time I've projected into the future, I've been wrong. <laughs> in other words, it's very hard to anticipate where the world will go. If you'd asked me that in 1994, when I saw all these young men flooding into the hermitage, I would have given a very different answer. So who knows what it'll be like 30 years from now. Let's see, I see a hand in the front row here. You talk about the beauty of experience, experiencing different religions. To what extent might that implicitly downgrade the going deep and the remaining within one religion? Mm. Very bounded and very limited. And it's like getting a sip of something. And we all know, I mean, I know as a writer, 
you only really know what writing is done if you is if you give yourself to it every yeah. hour of the day, more or less, for 30 years. So, exactly so. That's why I called myself a tourist who's admiring what these people have to offer, but haven't given myself in the same way I've given myself to a, a very different discipline. So, boundaries is precisely the right word. Yes, and certainly uh, the people I know who immerse themselves deeply uh, often have a quality that is unlike yes. any other, yes. no matter which tradition it is. Yes. Yes, you can feel it. I'm a little uncomfortable talking about this, but there's a certain segment of society um, that lives a monastic life, and that's people on the autistic spectrum continuum. So this is possibly, this could be a great research study if um, somebody with an area of expertise in autism could test the people in, in the monasteries. But because I would suspect that many of them are on the high end of the autistic spectrum continuum, and that could be a, a source for younger people to be a part of that community. And it could be great for people on the continuum to have a community where they fit in. Just a suggestion. Yeah, so I actually want to ask uh, Elaine about that in a second, but as I was listening to you, I was thinking, um, among my monk friends who I've got to know well over 31 years, some are running towards something and some are running away from something. Running toward what? I didn't hear that. Oh, uh, something. I, I deliberately yeah, didn't yeah. specify. They're running towards yeah. God or they're running towards the divine okay. or running towards the life of sacrifice and surrender. Okay. And others are running away from a society they don't feel comfortable in. And for every day, for 27 years, there was a very kind person who would come and bring our lunch to the retreatants every morning, every afternoon, and I got to know him wonderfully, and he was extremely shy, and he suddenly died, and the monk said actually he was a high function, on high-functioning autistic, and they had really had given him a shelter, and they said a large part of their life was looking after him, making him feel safe, and I think he felt very safe. But what I wanted to ask Elaine was, does Tanya Lerman deal with, with those, with, you know, possibilities of autism or other kind of things fitting into the religious experience? Or? Not, I don't recall that she was speaking about that specifically. She, um, I, I love her work, it's so interesting because as an anthropologist, she starts, she is an anthropologist, but she's working also with doctors and, um, and she was looking at, as I said, at visions and uh, voices that people hear and looking at, at those phenomena both in religious context and in mental hospitals. Uh, and she had three control groups. One was in this country, in California. One is in India, Chennai. And one is in Ghana. So she, she chose different cultures with different perceptions or different expectations about whether you hear voices of the dead, uh, whether you see visions, um, and, uh, and so I guess the exploration of, of the range of human experience, especially when you're dealing with unusual kinds of experience or particular kinds of sensitivity, is something that she and others are exploring. Mm. And I think it's very useful to do that. I know there's a psychologist at Columbia who's talking about spirituality as a way to calm the mind, and there's a lot of that yeah. talk like that, yeah. which is no doubt true. But how different people relate to different forms of practice and need for medicine yes. of the kind that these traditions can offer um, is still something we're just beginning to understand, I think. Yes, mindfulness is a response to PTSD, for example, in the armed services and elsewhere. I was also thinking in answer to the gentleman's really good question about boundaries, and it's a good warning to everybody, or at least to me, the Tibetans always say, much better to dig one well that's 60 foot deep than 10 wells that are 6 foot deep each. In other words, there's no substitute to actually giving yourself entirely to one course. Pico, it's uh, really inspiring to see you in person. I've been a big fan of your work for, for decades. Uh -huh, thank you. 
Your work to me embodies internationalism and a spirit of openness that coincided with much of my life of the past 35 years. And in the last few years, whether it was the rise of nationalism in the US, Europe, India, China, COVID, uh, many of us are questioning whether that spirit of internationalism still exists, whether there will be a global soul for the next 50 years. What are your thoughts about that? Incrementally, individual by individual, the world is becoming more global as we sit here. Everywhere around the world, this evening, a Japanese woman is meeting a German man. A Swedish man is meeting a Thai woman. The children that come out of those uh, unions are not going to be able to define themselves in the traditional way. The number of people who, as it were, don't belong to a single nationality is already something like 320 million. It's the fastest growing population in the world. There will soon be more of those than there are of Americans. And when we survey the landscape of the people we watch or admire, whether it's Zadie Smith or Malcolm Gladwell or President Obama or Naomi Osaka, everywhere you go, these are people living outside the old boundaries of, of black and white. So now I, I think I might have said once on this very stage um, that nationalism, I think, is on the rise because it's on the run. In other words, it realizes that the force of history is moving very quickly in an opposite direction. And so people are banding together against the fact that, for example, in cities, maybe the majority of people have many cultures inside them. And in the countryside, they're living sometimes in a different century, and those two are at odds. But uh, I don't think Brexit or other developments recently, politically, in the world, are changing the fact that people are exposed to the other and fall in love with the other, and then produce somebody who's doubly other, as it were. Um, I, when I was at school in England, there were 1,250 students, all boys, and 1,230 of them were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, so even Catholics and Jews stood out. And there were three of us with dark skins. So now, two generations later, I visit that same high school, and it looks like this auditorium, or more so. In other words, every other kid is Korean or Russian or Chinese or a blend of all of those. And of course, that's what you see in every classroom. And I think when I step into a classroom, what really hits me wonderfully is that all these students at a very young age are befriending, learning from, and being exposed to kids from every possible tradition and culture. And without even knowing it, are learning about the call to prayer or uh, um, Sikh practice or why Hindus are often vegetarians, all of that. That wasn't happening when I was a kid. And I think the world has immeasurably moved forwards in that direction and will only continue to move forwards. And thank you for the question, because it's certainly on many people's minds. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, Pico. I really enjoyed um, many of the images and ideas that you brought um, to us today. I think one phrase that stuck out to me was this notion of fleetingly being in golden webs of meaning. And I think very often, especially I guess as a writer, um, it can feel like old webs of meaning or things that once conjured magic in the world can no longer have that same force or power. And I was wondering sort of, whether you envision the collapse of old meaning systems within one's life as sort of this journey through the underworld that you describe, or how you engage with losing that sense of magic or connection to that sense of magic as a writer, and I guess in the context of overall what we're discussing, how contemplation or silence brings that back to you. Yes, I couldn't catch every word of that, but my sense is nothing lasts forever. And the only way to be in sync with the world is to realize that everything is permanently evolving and taking um, new forms. And you know, I'm sort of an old fogey, so I like the way things were when I was in my 20s. But that's not the way it should be for everyone in their 20s now. Uh, and I th were you talking about the erosion of b belief systems or meanings? Yes, so institutions are probably more discredited now than when I was a kid. And so people are reaching out for their own answers, but many of us are not able to find our own answers. So I think at some level, we're always going to need wise people, counselors, and, and maybe communities. Because I think one of the great things religion has always offered to people is a sense of community and that you're not alone 
um, and that when you go through the many griefs you will, there are others there who've been through them in the same way, and there are people there who are seasoned and can guide you through that. So, uh, so I'm, I'm not worried about um, the disappearance of those things, because insofar as they're an expression of human longing, I don't think human longings are going to change so much. Hello. Uh, Elaine and Pico, really humbling uh, to, to listen to the two of you speak. Uh, Pico, uh, you had mentioned uh, early on in this conversation that London uh, was something like history and that mm. California was something like hope. Uh, where's New York? <laughs> <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Everything, you said, yes. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll dodge that <laughs> in a very unpopular and undiplomatic way by saying uh, I've written a lot about Canada <laughs> and I spend a lot of time in Canada because I really feel they have a sense of history, they have a sense of irony and they sense a uh, sense of humor that I recognize from England or France and they really have a sense of future uh, and a sense of possibility and, and great optimism and they've taken in the rest of the world so generously uh, they've gone out into the world to learn about every other culture uh, and although Japan is far and away my favorite country, the society I most admire in the world is, is Canada precisely because I think it sits at the center of hope and history uh, and uh, I feel great intelligence there but great openness which is a nice combination uh, and, and great depth but great fluidity too because uh, the culture is changing every moment. And it spot, partly speaks to the earlier question about internationalism. I'm so impressed that Pierre Trudeau, way back in the 1970s, realized that the world was moving in this direction and decided to throw his arms around it as an opportunity and make a whole new kind of society in which the sum of the parts would be greater than the whole. Um, and I think Toronto was one of the first major cities where the average person you met on the streets was born in a foreign country. London has now attained that happy status, and New York is probably very close to it. I mean, certainly in parts of Queens, I'm guessing most people were born far away. So I think uh, rather than focusing on New York or Toronto, as I might be tempted to do, it's certain cities that are surging towards a future, and the countryside that for good reasons and less good reasons is living sometimes in a different century. And our question, our challenge is how to reconcile them. Thank you. Um, one of the most charming aspects of these evening has been listening to the two of you together. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how the two of you became friends and, and what, attracted, what attracts you to one another. So uh, I'll begin and you can correct me. <laughs> you know, Elaine had been my great, great friend from afar because I was reading all her books since the Gnostic Gospels in, in the 1980s. Uh, but really, I first met Elaine four years ago when I had the great good fortune to be in Princeton uh, for three months. And then I interviewed Elaine on stage in Santa Barbara just the month before the pandemic. So although we've only spoken publicly or privately maybe four times in our lives, I instantly felt this was a, a, an old friend and a great friend for all the reasons that you can see, that we've been walking along these very parallel paths, crossing in midair in maybe 1970 <laughs> as you were flying to England and I was hurrying away from it. Um, yes. But uh, yes. yeah, just I, I feel a great sort of lovely recognition of familiarity. That happens, as you know, with friendships. I mean, uh, I don't know how to explain it and wouldn't try, <laughs> but, uh, but I know it's happened. <laughs> very glad of that. Yeah. No, I, I mean, since we're coming to an end, I should probably say uh, I've, done, I've dis discussed this new book quite a bit, and I've never had as rich a discussion as this, so I'm so grateful to you for coming here and, and make, making things alive and real. Well, when, when I went to Santa Barbara, uh, Pico invited me to speak about my book, and I had never had such a wonderful conversation as that, so I was thinking, how can I possibly reciprocate? <laughs> <laughs> Look at all those notes. That's a reciprocation. Well, it's just that the book, the book brings up so many things. I mean, it's 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 very de it's like it's like lots of jewels. I mean, it's very detailed, and and every detail quite clear, and with different variegated colors. So 
there's a great deal there to explore and to enjoy, and I'm sure you will when you read this book. Thank you. Thank you. Join me in giving a big hand. It's such an amazing journey that I feel both of you have, I mean, I feel like I've been with your books and that they're on journeys and, uh, and that sort of notion of them being parallel but intertwining really keeps arising. And um, join us now, we have books on sale and uh, Pico has generously offered to sign books if you get one tonight. And uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I hope to see you again soon.